Next on Monitor is Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence Spivak. Ready for the unrehearsed discussion are Dr. Arnold Toynbee and our panel of newsmen, Clifton Daniel, New York Times, Leon Pearson, NBC News, John Jessup, Life Magazine, and Lawrence E. Spivak. Dr. Toynbee is the world-famed historian who has been the director of studies of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London and is the author of many books, including A Study of History and Reconsiderations. Now the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brooks. One of the great works of our time is a ten-volume history touching nearly every aspect of man's life in the ancient and the modern worlds. It is entitled A Study of History, and it traces the record of 21 civilizations. The research for this work extended over a period of nearly 35 years. The author, Dr. Arnold J. Toynbee, is our guest today. Recently, Dr. Toynbee has become a source of controversy because of statements on current history. He served in the British government in both world wars, and for 30 years he was research professor of international history at the University of London. On his current visit to the United States, he served as a visiting professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. And now we're ready to start the questions, Mr. Spivak. Uh, Dr. Toynbee, Premier Khrushchev says that he believes the Western civilization is in its final stages of decline. I believe you've made a careful study of most of the civilizations of our t all times. Will you tell us whether you see any significant signs that Western civilization is in decline? Well, I think in um, every civilization, every stage of its history, there are always signs of decline, signs of growth. But when you're in the middle of the story, it's very hard to tell what's really happening. When you can look back on a past civilization, it's much easier to see where one stands. But uh, um, I'm, on the whole, an optimist. I expect uh, the Twos and froze, ups and downs, but that the uh, thing will be rather inconclusive. Well, are, are you saying that we're declining but not very fast, or that we decline and we rise? Um, I'm saying I'm not sure where we stand, but I think we have a great deal of uh, power of decision ourselves as to what happens to us. Well, there, now, there are many people who believe that communism and Western democracy cannot uh, coexist. What's your feeling on that? Do you think we can coexist? Uh, if we can't, the human race can't exist, but uh, 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 I think myself we can coexist, just like Protestants and Catholics, Muslims and Christians uh, who had to coexist. Uh, Dr. Toynbee, uh, some time ago on another television program, you said that America had lost the leadership of her own revolution. Yes. What, what exactly did you mean by that? Uh, I meant that... Um, after the original American Revolution, this uh, set things rolling all over the world. There was a famous line of Emerson's, the shot heard around the world, and it was. And uh, it was heard in Europe and Asia and everywhere, but uh, round about the time of the uh, Communist Revolution in Russia in 1917, towards the end of the First World War, I think America changed her attitude. She became conservative-minded on the whole instead of revolutionary. And I think she's, since then, been inclined to represent what vested interests, status quo, things as they are, in contrast to her uh, 19th and 18th century position. You, you do believe, and I gather from what you've written, yeah. that our present civilization is being challenged as no civilization has ever been challenged before, is that correct? Well, perhaps not as none has been challenged before. It is being challenged very severely, and uh, to meet it, we can't just uh, they put as we are. We have to do well, something. How, how do you, can you tell us specifically, or a bit more specifically than you have in some yes. of your writings, how you see that challenge? Uh, well, um, I think we are the rich minority of the human race, we in the West, including Western Europe. Uh, and I think the poor majority are determined to get equality and to get to perhaps a, a fairer share of the good things of this world. This is quite apart from communism. This is the general feeling of the masses in Asia and uh, Africa and Latin America. And the question is, um, I think they're going to get this equality, and uh, who's going to give it to them? Are we going to come out and help them, or uh, is communism or some other ideology? 
Well, uh, don't you think from what you know of the democracies and from the progress we have made in building material things that we have the greater ability and the greater capacity to give them the things or to help them get the things that they want, much more than the communists? Well, uh, if we are willing to help them, to go all out to help them, uh, but uh, supposing we were to um, concentrate on guarding what we have ourselves, that would be rather a fatal line for us to take, I think. So we have a choice, I think, of policies. Mr. Pearson. Sir, I'd like to uh, take up this question yeah. of the challenge and the response, yeah. which you've been just now yeah. discussing. But I'd like to bring it down, if I may, yeah. to this particular pasture, so to speak, that yeah. is the United States. You've been yeah. visiting us. Yeah. And I dare say in the course of your many visits, you've found some aspects of American society which you can admire. But may I ask you quite candidly, sir, yeah. to tell us what aspects of our civilization, that is the American society, yes. you perhaps do not admire, yes. and in that, in doing so, will you tell us whether you think that we have, in this country, the capacity to respond to the challenge which uh, we have before the world? This country has repeatedly shown capacity to respond. Sometimes it's been slow in responding because of sheer size, I think. It takes a long time for things to seep through the whole American people. But um, again and again, you've shown your power to respond. Or, uh, also, I think what is true of America is true in some degree of uh, the other Western peoples in Europe and so on as well. Uh, I would say that our great danger is that uh, uh, we're setting the standard of value on the maximum amount of consumer goods per head that the oh. individual has, and that this is not really a, a winning ideal or a worthy ideal for a, a great civilization. By that, do you mean that we are too self-indulgent in this country? Uh, yes, really. Uh, really too, uh, too much thinking in terms of uh, maximum personal possessions. Do you feel that our response that we are giving now uh, is perhaps expressed too much in militant terms? Um, Yes, I, I don't think uh, uh, war or sort of war, uh, aggressive line, is the real answer. I think what we are contending for with the communists is the uh, support and goodwill of the majority of the human race, who are neither communists nor Western. And, may, I ask uh, one, may I ask one yeah. more question in the same connection? Yeah. That is to say, a uh, question about mass education in our country. Yeah. I believe you have said that mass education sometimes tends to level everybody so that the leaders are not encouraged to rise. Uh, do you feel that that is true with regard to the United States? And do you think it's a mistake for us to have attempted, as we have, to educate the masses? I've been concerned in my own country as a tendency to keep children, the able and the brilliant children, back to the average level of their <coughs> age which is the new tendency with us, and that's um, very much so, I believe, in this country, to keep them in their age class and don't let them go ahead. And as um, um, talent is the only uh, capital asset the human race has, it's a pity to suppress it, I think. Mr. Dan Mr. Daniel. Professor Toynbee, to return to an earlier yeah. question and to be specific, yeah. uh, Premier Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, has repeatedly said that, the, that communism will eventually and inevitably <coughs> triumph over Western democracy or Western capitalism. Yeah. From the, your vantage point as a historian yeah. taking a long view, does that seem probable or likely to you? Um, <coughs> when he says that, he makes me think of all the other people who've said that before. Hitler with his thousand year Reich, or all the religions which say they're going to convert the whole human race, or the empires who say they're going to conquer the whole world. Well, some religions conquered, have converted an awful lot of people, and some empires uh, conquered a lot of territory. But nobody so far has uh, done the whole thing, and uh, I think it's unlikely that he will. So I think he is miscalculating, probably. What, uh, what are the basis of his miscalculations? What are the great weaknesses in his system that will make it impossible for him, like these other people who've said the same sort of thing, to achieve his goal? Uh, Bosnianism is one great weakness of the Russians. Um, take this uh, particular thing between Russia and the United Arab Republic, um, which, as the uh, uh, Egyptians have pointed out, is the same thing that happened between Yugoslavia and Russia some years back. Um, I think the Russians had a great advantage so far. They've been much less known than we Westerners have been, therefore less disliked. As if you're known, you're probably disliked. 
but uh, the more they get known, <laughs> the more they get disliked, just as we are disliked. And so the thing will equalize itself out, I think. Let's look at the other side for yeah. a moment. What are the... Um, what are the... Uh, it's often thought, I think, yeah. by people in this country, perhaps erroneously, that we are falling behind the Russians in yeah. some respects. Would you say that that's true? And if so, what are our weaknesses? Why do we fall behind when we have such tremendous uh, human, uh, we think moral and spiritual, as well as material yeah. resources? Well, uh, isn't it the use of your material resources? At present, um, um, a, tr a tremendous amount is spent uh, not only on uh, consumer goods per head, but on unnecessary superfluous consumer goods, which people are rather bullied into buying by kind of Madison Avenue methods. Isn't that a, a great, great weakness and handicap for... Is, for is your society? remedy then to abolish Madison Avenue? <laughs> oh, if I could, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jessup. Dr. Tornby, I'd like to uh, clear up this question of the relationship of communism to uh, Western civilization. Yes. You have said, I believe, that communism is a Western invention. Yes. It was created in the British Museum. Yes. The Russians and the Chinese could not have created it yes. for themselves. Yes. It's our export, I believe. You also said that it was, therefore, a means of the Westernization of Russia. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Russia, however, yeah. is... Uh, has not been part of Western civilization. Is that true? It's been a separate civilization from the West? Well, the uh, <coughs> Eastern Christian world and the Western, I think, have been separate as a matter of degree, but uh, right back to the Byzantine Empire in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. um, they've been separate and rather opposed to each other. Apart from the fact that uh, it was created in the British <coughs> Museum, what is yeah. there about communism that makes it specifically a Western idea. May not it have been changed by uh, Lenin, Stalin, and so on into a hostile and oriental idea? I don't know that the idea has been changed. Um, I suppose if Marx came back to life, he would uh, recognize uh, Russian and, and Chinese communism as being uh, communism w with some changes. But um, uh, the purpose, I think, uh, has changed, perhaps. I, mean, I think the purpose in both Russia and China is to uh, put Russia and China up in the world they, and do it quick. Uh, and would this be... Uh, <coughs> would would uh, uh, Western civilization be able to encompass uh, uh, this challenge? You've spoken about a communist yes. form of Western civilization. <laughs> yes. And that the two will uh, grow together over the uh, over the long term. Uh, that is, with each decade of coexistence, uh, 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 Western and communist civilization become one. Is that what you feel? I, they become less unlike each other. Probably, I think. Um, um, isn't the one big job that they are both doing now competitively, and that is uh, helping the majority of the human race to raise its standard. Uh, we're competing with each other over that at present. We might do it cooperatively later on, I don't know. Mr. Spivak. Mr. Toynbee, do I understand you to mean that our present high standard of material uh, living, uh, yeah. material living of standard, uh, is one of our handicaps in fighting the Cold War? Uh, very much so, yes. I've been visiting a number of uh, Asian countries uh, in the last few years. I was in Afghanistan and Pakistan, India, for instance, uh, last year. And uh, uh, this creates a tremendous personal and psychological barrier between uh, Westerners of all nations, which especially perhaps Americans, and the people of those countries. Uh, but, but this is the standard of living all of them seek, and the Russians, the communists themselves, are trying to attain our standard <laughs> of living. Why should this be hurtful to us? Uh, are they trying to attain the American standard of living? I think uh, Khrushchev has spoken about this and says that uh, in Russia there will never be a, a, a car for each person. They'll probably have uh, cars to borrow when they need them. He but, he's also, but he's also said that not only will they attain, but they will surpass our standard of living. Uh, surpass the total production, but uh, probably use it for different purposes, uh, much less in the private sector and more in the public, perhaps. Well, what will be, what kind of standard of, of living do you think we should, we should seek? 
we seek better living, we seek more food, uh, maybe we have too many cars, uh, we seek more clothing for our own people, this is the standard of living we seek, what do you think we ought to eliminate? And, uh, I think probably in most Western countries, people work too hard to uh, earn money to buy things they don't really need. We're cluttered up with material possessions. We have there's an optimum degree of material possessions. You, most of the world has always had too, too few, and that's the case of most of the human race today. But uh, you can have too much for uh, your happiness and comfort, I think. Well, should, should we stop producing these things, in your judgment, or should we start producing them and give them away more? We've uh, given away billions of dollars. How much more should we give away? Uh, start producing to give away, yes. Uh, I think you'll get more satisfaction for giving away to meet uh, people's real needs, other people's real needs, than to meet sort of thought-up needs of, of your own, which aren't real needs. But, but Dr. Toynbee, you yeah. know the United States has given away more than 80 billion dollars. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't uh, gotten either more satisfaction or has it made mm. more friends. Do you think that if we gave twice as much away, we would get, make twice the mm. friends we have? Or? Well, uh, it has got some satisfaction, made some friends. And what about the Marshall Plan? Didn't that uh, just yes, salvage that... Europe? Uh, uh, it's a very difficult thing to give away because um, you have to be sure that the, what you give goes to the, through the right channels to the right pockets, and that is difficult. But um, I believe you will learn how to do it. But you don't think we ought to stop producing. You ought to think we ought to continue and increase production, but we ought to give more away. Yes. Well, after all, the world, human race as a whole, needs far more production. The, the human race as a whole is um, uh, on starvation level still pretty well. So. We can't have too much production. It's distribution that uh, matters. Dr. Toynbee, right yeah. along that line, yeah. in your lifetime, you've seen a tremendous advance in the scientific development of the world. Yes. We've seen the airplane. We have yeah. even have television yeah. and a lot yeah. of other yeah. things. I'm wondering whether in the next 70 years you expect uh, uh, scientific progress of that same kind to be achieved. I suppose so. I don't see any slackening in scientific uh, development. It seems to be going faster and faster. Do you think it will be <coughs> as beneficial to the race as the last 70-year progress has been? Well, has it been beneficial the last 70 years? It's been uh, used for weapons mostly, is not it? And, That's quite uh, true. Slaughter in the two wars, uh, um, and uh, now piling up atomic armaments. We well, then, do you view with some alarm the scientific uh, progress that might lie ahead of us? I view with some alarm the use we may make of it. Uh, it's neutral in itself. It gives us tremendous new power for good or evil. Uh, which we going to use it for? Mr. Pearson. Sir, uh, in that connection, yeah. and speaking of new weapons, yes. I'm reminded that I read a statement of yours in which you said the major problem confronting the world today yes. is the avoidance of a third world war. Yes. I should like very much to have you tell us how you think this can best be done, and in doing so, sir, would you say whether you have uh, confidence in what we or the military call the nuclear deterrent. Um, it is a deterrent at present, and I don't think um, uh, any of the governments that possess nuclear weapons at present are going deliberately to use them. They, in that sense, they do deter each other. But there are uh, snags about this. One thing, uh, um, many other countries may get the nuclear weapon. Um, France may get it. Uh, China, it's rather formidable if China got it. Uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, oh, they might all get it in the end, and then where would we be with uh, dozens of little governments with nuclear weapons? Uh, also, there is the danger of um, accidents, isn't there? Um, I don't know about the U-2, but uh, some junior officer might uh, do a U-2 on his <laughs> initiative, or because he mistook his orders and so on. You'd uh, rather, I take it, you'd rather go in the opposite direction and try to eliminate uh, these weapons? Uh, yes. I don't believe in unilateral disarmament. I don't think that's practical politics, but I do believe we should work for elimination of armaments by agreement. Difficult though that is. Would you do you support, sir, the present position of the West in this regard? That is, a position which insists upon what we call a foolproof inspection system before we will go into any uh, disarmament. Oh, I believe in inspection. I don't believe you can get 100% foolproof inspection if people wish to cheat. You have to take some risks, in other words. Uh, we are taking a risk in not disarming. 
if you disarm uh, even the best inspection won't be completely foolproof and uh, that's another risk to my mind a lesser risk mr daniel uh, professor toynbee still talking about the issues of war and yes. peace you have quoted winston churchill as saying that the second world war was the unnecessary yes. war uh, if you would venture to be a prophet will we have a third one and is it necessary um, i don't believe we will have a third one that's a very dangerous thing to say I was going to say, I want to make a fool of oneself in saying, but I wouldn't be there to be made a fool of, so <laughs> if there was a third war. Um, it's certainly not necessary, I would say. Uh, why would you say that it is not necessary, or what can we do to make sure that it doesn't occur? Um, the only way to make sure that it doesn't occur is to get a reduction of armaments by agreement. Um, of course, unilateral disarmament by one side would ensure that it wouldn't occur, but I don't believe either side is going to do that, so that's not practical. But uh, if by agreement we uh, could uh, uh, disarm, uh, that would uh, ensure that it wouldn't happen. And I believe you've got to do that. Well, you have uh, said, I think, also in relation to the Second World War, that one of the reasons why that war occurred was because the United States uh, failed to play its full role in preventing it. Yes. Would you say that we are playing our full role today in preventing the approach of a Third World War? Um, for playing the, your, your full um, military role is deterrent business, certainly. But um, I don't think that... Um, the competition is really going to take the military form. I think it's going to take this form of, com of competitive help to the underdeveloped countries. And uh, this, is, this brings us back to this question of the use of production. What are we going to use it for? Mr. Jessup. Dr. Twinby, as I understand your pattern of history, uh, the West now is on the verge of a universal state or in need of forming a universal state in order to eliminate disorders. Must this be a universal state in the literal sense, namely the first worldwide state, in your view? Are we, are we approaching a, 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 a one world? Well, I think everything now is worldwide. Uh, the kind of arena of uh, military competition and of economic competition is worldwide. Uh, um, most of the important activities, uh, communications, for instance, uh, now are worldwide. And therefore, I think uh, uh, a world state would have to be a literally worldwide state I in the future. But I don't think it can be done by force. Most of the past empires have been built by conquest, haven't they? Now, uh, war wouldn't uh, unite the world, it would more or less... <laughs> liquidate the human race probably so it has to be done by agreement would uh, uh, suppose a a uh, a uh, wider state yeah. uh, than our than the present national yeah. systems yeah. were created and were still somewhat short of global yeah such as a uh, north atlantic uh, unity of some kind would you regard that as a forward or a backward step well it um, wouldn't do what's needed because it would be only one of the two camps into which the world is divided. Uh, what we want is something that bridges a division, it seems to me. Mr. Spivak. Dr. Toynbee, yeah. do you think a world uh, government is possible or probable? I believe it will come piecemeal. Uh, for instance, um, the population of the world is going to double or treble or more than that uh, at the lowest estimate before the end of this century, isn't it? Well, uh, long before that's happened, we shall have to have a world agency with uh, overriding powers for the production and distribution of the world's food supply, because we can't afford to have famine, pestilence, war breaking loose again. Uh, we had, at the end of the war, a thing called UNRWA, which did that. It'll have to be... be You've be, also said, though, that yeah. you believe that man's desire for liberty is inborn. Now, yeah. Isn't diversity the inevitable result of uh, freedom and of liberty? I mean, do you think you can get all people together if they're free to do as they please? You have to have unity for some things and diversity for others, I think. Just as in this country, you have uh, diversity of states, but unity of the union overriding it. Dr. Kirby, I'd like to, before we go off the air, I'd like to ask you one uh, question about uh, uh, 
uh, what you wrote in the New York Times Magazine, 1959. You said this about Mr. Khrushchev. You said he had a sense of responsibility and humanity towards his own people naturally in the first place, but also towards mankind as a whole. Yeah. Do you still believe that? Uh, I suppose Mr. Khrushchev is a, um, a believing communist, and uh, just as the representatives of the world religions of the past have uh, felt they were benef benefiting humanity by uh, trying to convert them to their faith, uh, I think he believes the same problem. And I don't think he wants to put uh, his people or but anyone else. I think else. you said you believe that. Do you believe that he has a uh, sense of humanity um, towards I, mankind as a whole? Uh, I'm sure I, he believes it, but do you believe it? Uh, I think so, but of course, a man who has a fanatical, ideological, religious faith, the um, greatest benefit he thinks he can do to people is to convert them at whatever risk, and um, that may not really be the greatest benefit. No, well, that's why I say, yeah. do you think he has a sense of humor? He thinks so, I'm sure of that, yes. but do you think so? Well, I think he's sincere, but um, and I think it's an awkward thing for the world. That All the, the questions, uh, Dr. Toynbee, is a quotation of yours in which you said you thought he had a sense of humanity. Yes. Do you think he has a sense of humanity? Um, I think so, but I think his uh, sense of humanity may not be altogether to the advantage of the human race. We have about one minute, Mr. Pearson. Sir, may I ask a quick question yeah. about the moon? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you, do you uh, support the enthusiasm that we have here in the West to put a man on the moon, and do you think it matters whether it's a Western man or a Russian? Um, I have no enthusiasm at all for putting either a Russian or a Western man on the moon. I think it's just like a football game or a baseball game, it's a rather childish competition. I'd like to use those resources for something quite different, for raising the standard of living of the great mass of the human race on this earth. Mr. Daniel. Professor Toynbee, do you believe then that there's life on other planets? And if so, what's that going to do to, to your history of the world? Won't it have to be written, rewritten if we make contact with people on other planets? Um, the nearest might have life is probably four light years or eight light years away, and uh, that's not a practical distance for... I think, gentlemen, on that note, I'll have to interrupt. I see that our time is up. Yes.